welcome to the Grill Podcast here. Uh, you got Dan and Brad and myself, and we're here at the Jefferson Seed Center. Uh, today, it looks like a, a chemical warehouse with all the chemical we've got. Uh, but in the future, uh, the building we're in is right next to our Jefferson site, um, where our new grain elevator's at. It's right across the railroad tracks. Uh, the building we're in used to be a part of um, of our beef feed center, and before that, owned by a different company. And uh, here at Landis, we've worked on transitioning this facility to either uh, general warehouse space, but for the long term and the longevity of our company, this is going to be our primary seed location. So for those of you that are, are watching or listening within the um, territory, um, some of you are probably familiar with the building. For those out of territory, um, it gives you a little bit of a look at what we have for uh, overall of our warehousing uh, system and uh, where the future looks like where we're going to launch some of our products from. So again, I got Brad here w with me today and Dan. Um, really what's on the agenda today, guys, we're going to do a little bit of a business update um, back looking at you know what's happening in fertilizer markets, what's happening in the chemical markets, um, different seed things. And then we're really going to dive into observations in the field. So today is the 17th of May. We got a lot of corn in the background. We got a lot of beans in the ground. And for the three of us sitting here, um, and some of the listeners that have been listening along the way, we've had Tyrannus on back about two months ago, uh, talking about their technology that they utilize from their drone technology for, as a scouting app. And uh, the one thing that we've been really excited about amongst the three of us is we're getting a lot of pictures and information back um, from that app and, or excuse me, from that program. And uh, it's honestly, it's fascinating um, what we found. And again, it's, it's the use of technology for a, a retailer like ourselves. We got acres in Illinois, we got acres in Nebraska, Southern Minnesota, Central Iowa. Um, you know, we've got a ton of acres in there. I think it's right at 49,500 acres across the state, Illinois, and a few other states um, in there that we're being able to observe what's happening across the United States and um, different farming practices and, and things that without this technology, you know, I don't know if we'd be having the same conversations that we've had, uh, you know, prior up to the planning for the podcast. So, uh, again, gentlemen, welcome and uh, appreciate you guys coming. Um, you know, we're going to start off a little bit as we always do, kind of a general business update. Um, you know, again, today being May 17th, there's about a few things left with fertilizer we got left to do. We're either going to side dress ammonia, we're going to top dress urea, or we're going to side dress UAN. Um, in general, those markets are very soft. Um, we're in a transition period from today, looking toward really fall and spring of next year already. So, um, this morning, prior to the podcast, I bet I talked to two or three different manufacturers, importers, different people in the industry around trying to get an idea of one, what's the outlook look like for the next 30 days? Is there more grower de demand to come? Is there more retailer demand to come? And then two, you know, what's the transition really look like as we transition to fall? So, you know, one thing I can tell you that I've seen and I'm beginning to see now is we are going to see an extremely hard reset in regards to fall ammonia. I know I've talked about it on the on the previous podcast before this, but um, you know the odds are the the U.S. farmer or the Central Iowa farmer ammonia is going to have a five in front of it when you buy it this fall. It's going to be somewhere around I'm going to call it five fifty plus or minus twenty five dollars, probably plus less than minus. But um, if I had to you know really draw a card today. As it stands today, that's probably where the market comes out at. Um, you think back to it, we kicked off retail fall prices last year at $1,085. Okay. So we've we've seen over a 50% reduction in ammonia cost. So, you know, for you guys that are dealing with farmers on a daily basis, um, I know we've had some devaluation of overall overall corn price, but when you think about that, that's some serious money to be cut out of the budget. So, you know, we're we're not looking at the $200 an acre type nitrogen plans anymore. Um, we're really skinnying that number down. And obviously, you know, nitrogen's all linked together and from a relative spread standpoint. Um, so if you got ammonia down that much, you're going to have UAN that's going to suffer greatly as well. Urea that's going to come down and be under a ton of pressure. Um, so when you're planning, or excuse me, planning for budgeting for next year, really be mindful of what the fall looks like. Um, you know, I know of guys that are heavily equipped, don't always want to be paying for somebody else to do the service for them, but it might be something you look at that if you know, you're going to be stressed to get some acres done. Um, you know, we're going to be doing custom ammonia. You might have us pick up a few acres for you just to make sure it gets done because we're going to be looking at the same scenario, um, this fall as we did last fall. 
um, as where we're still going to have this kind of boogeyman out there in the market of trying to understand what's going to happen in Western Europe. Okay, the war's still going on. It's it's literally rinse and repeat every year. We're going to get to fall, and it's going to the question is going to be is the U is the European consumer going to have enough natural gas to make it through winter? We are going to come upon that at some point. So. Um, if I'm a grower today, my ag retailer is going to have an ammonia price for me in the next 60 days. You really need to be mindful of your ability to take advantage of that pro of that price because um, when we get to that point, you know it's going to be an effective price. It's going to be cost effective, and it's going to be an opportunity for you to lock that in. When you're looking at that fall versus spring, again, the biggest thing when you look at spring ammonia is you're going to have the outlier of what could happen in Europe, what could happen with war. So. Um, good thing to look forward to at the farm level. Again, huge reset, and you're talking 50 plus percent reset from fall to fall. Um, so be mindful of that, and and be be ready when your retailer calls to say, "I have an ammonia price. We are firm believers that it's a good price for you for fall." Work on different financing options. Is that what I would say? I've had a lot of conversations with our retail sellers this morning already about you know what can we do from a financing standpoint. Interest rates for growers, no different than retailers. I know when I look at the P&L every month, the interest bill is something that makes me a little sick from the inventory cost that we're carrying. Um, I'm sure somewhat at the at your local level for farming, you know, you're know, you looking at your borrowing notes and different things like that, and that's not a, a huge uh, fun ordeal either. You know, One thing that we're gonna have to look at together in the supply chain is how do we maybe offer a little bit of differentiated uh, short-term financing on maybe some inputs uh, to get you past the first of the year and um, I think when we come out with prices, we're definitely going to have a cash price offer, but we're also probably going to look at, um, is there a way that we can, you know, offer some terms, a little higher price and uh, give some flexibility around, you know, what is out there for um, for the farmer. Uh, you know, when you look at the P&K market, again, my phone is ringing off the hook first thing this morning. I had two or three different importers calling, wanting to sell uh, summer fill phosphates. Um, you know, when you correlated that to the retail level, you're probably 650, 660 phosphates, maybe a little bit higher than that, um, 680-ish uh, to the grower for MAP. You know, in my level today, we just got done planting the crop. We just got done doing spring fertility. I'm worn out, okay? I, I am tired of thinking about dry fertilizer. The ammonia, I can get my, my head wrapped around because it's down significantly, Um you know, I think there's more opportunities to continue that, that prices are going to have an opportunity to buy here through spring. Globally, with ammonia coming down, that's just leaving more margin there. Um, and the overall pricing scheme for phosphates, as well as sulfur, continues to come down. So, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if EDM or other companies in the market that kind of have that direct ship model don't present some prices to the market near term. Um, I don't know as a farmer if I'm just jumping in whole hog. We haven't seen what potash prices are doing. And I think a little bit we got to see what's going to happen with this crop as it develops to kind of understand what kind of yield potential we have. Um, what's my budget and cash flow situation going to look like this fall? Um, obviously, if those guys got revenue insurance out there, you know, you kind of know exactly what, no matter what, what you're going to have. But um, those are the things that I think I'd be watching out for when, when people are calling here early. Um, I don't know if phosphates are quite there. I think you know they're they're a fair price compared to what they were a year ago, but we're also not dealing with seven dollar corn like we were a year ago. Overall, the nearby corn prices are still friendly, somewhat with basis levels, but you know we're sub five dollar corn on new crop corn right now. So um, something to be mindful of, something to be aware of that they're out there. But I don't know if it's something that I'm jumping into uh, whole hog. You know, and again, the kind of to sum up really the business update portion of the podcast. Um, obviously we're sitting here, we got chemical all around us, um, you know, for our size and scope of business, you know, somebody might look at it and say, yeah, we got guys got quite a bit. Um, we have a facility like this in Iowa Falls, uh, Iowa, and we have about 15,000 square foot on this side of the building that's here. Um, you know, I can tell you right now, when I came in here in February, it was hard to walk. Uh, there was a lot of inventory in here. We were really prepping up for spring season. Um, we've moved a lot of the inventory out and uh, to destination, but you know, as we see things continue to slide in the chemistry markets, you want to have no chemistry left over from this year. Okay, you got extra ditches to spray or whatever it may be, and you got some glyphosate laying around, and you own it at high, own it at high prices. Don't be afraid to go spray uh, the rocks a few more times to get rid of some weeds, clean up, make everything look nice, because next year 
Um, we are going to be dealing with with sub twenty dollar glyphosate, um, glufosinate or Liberty. I'm not sure where that really settles out at, but uh, it's under significant pressure. Clethodum. I mean, some of the components that go into your major fungicides. Everything is under pretty serious um, price pressure from a tech AI standpoint coming out of China. And I think those are things as a grower, um, it's better to inventory yourself. Make sure you're in a position when we get to this uh, prepay season for 24 cropping season, you're really ready to, um, at that point, load up. Um, having a little extra inventory when you look at coming to this um, uh, prepay season is probably not going to hurt you as much because we're going to be dealing with prices that are on the um, lower end of the price uh, spectrum that we've seen in the last probably four years. So um, just something to be mindful of. And again, um, those that have inventory, use it up, get those fields clean and, and don't leave anything uh, left to be um, in there. So, all right, now pivoting to really the infield observations, I really want to spend some time with the two gentlemen sitting here with me because, again, I don't know how many phone calls we've spent between the two of us the last 15 days with looking at the information from Tyrannus, which we are going to post some of those pictures. Um, you know, obviously it's not going to, it's not going to have anybody's information on it, but we're going to show some visuals that we're seeing from the app um, and, and some more or less some demonstrations on different practices that we f overall foresee that are maybe something that uh, growers need to think of. Um, and we're going to spend some serious time in this um, overall section talking about tillage and trash. Um, one thing that we've definitely noticed is, Trash management has got to be key, um, especially for us here in, in central Iowa and southwest Iowa, where we have a lot of no-till. Um, it looks like, you know, from everything we're seeing this year, a few more corn-on-corn -corn acres um, in the no-till geographies. You know, how do you manage that trash? How do you make sure that you're creating clean seed bed? Um, and then some, you know, comparables with different farming practices, such as, you know, conventional till, strip till, um, you know, modified till, whatever you want to call it for minimal till. But um, those are the things we're really going to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to you two guys. You know, I wrote down for in my notes in the infield observations, emergence, trash, and we're going to go through trash really in a in a deeper dive. And then, you know, where do we go from here as we look to the next podcast? What's going to happen in the next 30 days? So, well, John, I'll, I'll, I'll add some uh, initial comments um, on the emergence side. And um, and as John said, there'll be some um, drone images that will be will be shown um, based off of these. One that you would see uh, right now is one of the first images that we saw from Tyrannus, and it was a planting date in that April 10th to the 15th. Um, and you can see that um, in this particular image, um, it, it's it's a very poor population. We're probably talking about 20,000 plants per. Acre. So to set some context uh, to this, um, received lots of calls. Yep. Um, uh, after that week of planting, and then ensuing weeks, it was still pretty cold, pretty cold soil temperatures. People said, "What? What do we do?" Uh, initially, I think even at the last pet podcast, um, we said, "You know, you go out there and look, and this, if the seed is nice and firm, um, we've had cool uh, temperatures, but we haven't had a lot of wet conditions, and so uh, everything looked." pretty decent. And um, then we started getting the images like the one that, that we've shown, and all of a sudden, um, there are a number of fields where populations aren't quite where people wanted them. And you can see from um, the images that uh, stock residue is fairly heavy. So this is one where corn was uh, no-tailed into continuous corn, and obviously it's the residue that had the impact here. That's one of the things I've, I've seen. Uh, Brad, you've seen some things as well. Yeah. Well, typically with the problem we run into a lot of times when you get those really heavy residue type situations, we tend to get some what we call hair pinning where the residue gets trapped in that seed furrow. The seed gets dropped in there, but it's really not into contact with the soil. So that takes more moisture to get the seed to germinate. The end result is you end up with a really uneven emergence. Those seeds that were in the furrow that were had really good seed to soil contact germinated came up and the seeds that were in or near that trash really didn't get the moisture they needed so they're behind that's one of the bigger issues we see the other thing i've noticed in a lot of these fields is 
It really takes a system. As we see more and more growers convert to what we know as vertical tillage, and vertical tillage implements generally are not going to resize that residue as some of the other tillage implements we use. So it kind of takes a system. And really, to get the best results, you really probably would want to have a chopping head yep. on the combine in conjunction with your vertical tillage implement. So that's one thing that we see a lot of, uh, having trash whippers on the planter set properly to clear that trash away so we get the good seed furrow, the good seed to sow contact is really imperative. So those are the ones that have really probably jumped out at us the most when we look at some of these uneven emergence fields in the pictures. Another thing that I saw, and actually, John, you were the one that uh, brought this to attention, and we'll put that slide up now, is that you can see this is drift tail. Yeah. Um, man, these populations are right about 99% of oh. what was intended. And you can see, if you look down the row, beautiful black soil in that strip was you still have the conservation, you still have the uh, residue and yep. middle to, to take care of those things. But And we're not saying everybody needs to go strip till, but it's just an observation. You're like, this year, it really made a difference. Well, I think the biggest thing with that, and again, the nice thing about us being invested into technology and looking at different farming practices is, you know, we, uh, it was just right off the bat when we looked at it and it's like, you know, and in different spots where, where guys are doing minimal till or no till, you're pulling off 250 bushel of corn. Okay. You have a ton of trash that you have to deal with right off the bat because you've done a good job at raising a great crop. Okay. So the next thing after that is when you start looking at some of these different farming practices, it's like, you know, how for some of these guys do you bring in the opportunity for them to um, learn, right? And that's really what it was for us is a learning op a learning opportunity around, um, you know, what does it look like if you have minimal till? What does it look like, you know, and, and we've got some farmers in, in uh, Tyrannus that both here in Southwest Iowa, uh, Northeast Iowa, Illinois that have strip till. Um, so they're operating in all sorts of different varieties, but really what it looks like, um, you know, for those guys to, to differentiate when those plant, when those plants were in the ground, um, you could, you can visually look at it and just tell it makes sense. And by no means am I a true agronomist because I'm not, but I look at something and I immediately called Dan and Brad both. And I'm like, Hey, look at this stuff and tell me what you think. You know, I'm like. And I'm like, you know, I don't know much about this, and I don't really know if it's our part to be talking about, it, you know, equipment any, by any means. Um, but I feel like we should have this conversation because the next call then was to somebody else on the equipment side and ask him, hey, what do you guys do for trash whippers? Like, what is it? Like, what what do they work? Do you have a recommendation? Do you have one that you like better than others? And it's always, their, their answer is, oh, it depends. What downforce were they running? What all this stuff is? So... You know, I think part of what we're going to do too is we're going to educate ourselves. And by doing that is we're going to bring in some experts on what that looks like for your planter setup, what that looks like for downforce uh, you need, what that looks like for your trash whippers, stuff like that. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing that we really need to to help evaluate is it's, it's not our position to maybe sell equipment or change somebody's decision, but maybe it's our opportunity just to provide some information understand how the process, how the system works, because it really is a system. It's a process. What we do out in the fields from crop year to crop year really ties itself together. Thinking about how does the fertility impact the residue that impacts the planting and emergence. You know, if I look at some of these fields and I see the poor emergence that we have and we see all the residue in the image, my first thought is carbon to nitrogen ratio. Yeah and paying that carbon penalty. So we're gonna apply nitrogen with the intent to feed the crop, but when you see the carbon to nitrogen ratio get high above 30 to one, that's when we start to see in fields residue from previous crops two years ago, maybe three years ago that haven't broken down. That really tells us we don't have good biological activity working for us. The nitrogen that we apply is actually being consumed by a lot of the microbes and biologicals out there. That's their primary food source. and as we go through the season, we're gonna to start to see on some of those areas, nitrogen deficiency show up earlier. We're probably gonna see some really uneven plant height across that field. And a lot of it always kind of can go back to what we did the previous year or years. So it's really understanding that system. The one neat thing that we can do 
if you think about our high yield learning group is we can do modeling. Yep. We can take that planting data from that grower's planter and on a field by field basis, we can model it. We can really help get them dialed into, well, how much down pressure should they have? Yep. So I think that's one of the unique things that we've got going here is, is learn. Well, and that's the exact same thing. I mean, what, literally talking to the implement dealer after we had had our conversation the next day, I mean, it was like, meet me at the office. Let's have this conversation. Show me the pictures so I can understand what you're seeing. I mean, it's just, again, it's a visual representation. And I think, again, it, it's the partner of the ag retailer, you know, the farmer and the implement dealer to be aligned with what works the best. And I'm going to tell you right now, just from seeing it, I don't think we know. I don't think we know. So um, it's kind of unique. We actually, you know, having the, going through this learning cycle, part of what we're going to end up doing next year is, is trying out different row cleaners. I mean, for a farmer... Um, or somebody that's, you know, you're going to farm 40 crops in your life, row cleaners or row units in general on a planter are not cheap. That's not something you just kind of throw money at. But, you know, for us in partnership with some of the key dealers in our lo central Iowa air location, you know, the ability to find um, a planter that's got multiple setups that we can demo some ability, not only get the visuals, get the harvest data on, hey, this actually had the best net return from spending the money um you know i think part of what we're going to do with our learning groups and again you know anybody can be a part of these is we're going to bring in precision planning experts or equipment experts to have this conversation for next year um and and we actually you know the two three of us sat down today and um we kind of mapped out what that looks like for 24 you know what meetings are we going to have uh we'd like to do a little bit of a tech conference that really you know again it, we're not there to sell many products it's more of practices, understanding, bringing in these experts that have seen it and put it to uh, to life. You know, for me, and a, a guy that doesn't truly understand equipment and agronomy, I was sending these guys, I didn't even know Precision Planning had a YouTube channel. I'm up at night watching stuff on Precision Planning's YouTube channel. I'm trying to learn about strip till uh, and educate myself because, you know, the, the proof's a little bit in the pudding. You could see the value right there. Um, and you know, for us in ag retail, it's like, okay, how do we, how do we implement this to help out the farmer of tomorrow? And, you know, and literally I'm looking at it right now on this piece of paper, we're trying to figure out, you know, can we do strip till ammonia and how many acres per hour can we get done a day? And is it a viable solution for the farmer tomorrow? Different things like that. So, I mean, I think the the exercise and the learning opportunity again, Brad, you, or Dan, you've been in it for how many years? How many years have you been doing it? Uh, 43 years, 35. And with the technology that we have today, we all have learned something this spring. You know, I think that's the important thing is you maybe have known it, but the ability to see that many acres at hand that fast. I mean, there's, there's some days we're from Tyrannus, we're getting back two, 3000 acres of scouting a day. You know, the ability to really hone in on that information is, is, is key for sure. And, you know, I, it'll be interesting. We'll continue to update people as we go through the season with, what we're finding and how the product works and is it a good fit for, for everyone. But, um, it's been a lot of fun so far. So, you know, and again, and we're going to talk more about this as we probably transition to fall and we're going to, you know, I would say this is going to be more of a common theme of where we're doing the podcast. I think we're going to get out of the office and provide it in a little bit more, um, agronomy setting. But the other thing I would say too, is, um, the one thing we're definitely going to come back to is planter setup, tillage, and what you're doing with your headers. And, you know, for guys that are definitely in a minimal till situation, you've got to have choppers on those heads because resizing, like uh, Brad said, resizing that residue, I think is key. And um, I don't know if we can do it enough. So the, the biggest question I got for the both of you is, you know, what's to come, you know, with everything we've seen for some early standpoint, you know, you live up by Fort Dodge and you're over by Waterloo. There's been a lot of rain in some areas, you know, what, what's to come, you know, what are we going to be talking about as we go through the summer? I think the biggest thing to keep on your radar coming up is going to be insects. If you look at the weather pattern we're in, if you think back a few weeks ago, you heard a lot of talk about the Omega formation that's moved off now. And so the weather pattern we're in is really set up to bring a lot of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico right up into the central corn belt. With that, you see a lot of insects, black cutworm moths, uh, true army worms. Those are insects that typically do not overwinter in Iowa. So when we get these southerly winds coming up, 
you know, they're going to bring a lot of moths. And I know the other day, the trap moth trap count at Kanawa from Iowa state was at 12 moths mm -hmm. in a 24 hour period. And typically any count over eight for a 48 hour window is considered high. Mm. So that's pretty significant. Keep an eye out on any of those areas where you may have weed escapes, grasses, yep. cover crops that haven't been terminated. Those are going to be the prime areas for the black cutworm moth to lay its eggs first. So that's where you'll start to see the, the damage and, you know, they'll come out and do some cutting. I think it's really going to be important to be very attuned to that because we've lost one of our most effective tools, which is the organophosphates. Mm -hmm. We cannot use those anymore. So having a good grasp of where you're at, if you need to get out and treat ahead of time, keep in mind that cutworm can cut that corn plant, even if it's knee high, it'll still cut it. So it's not a kind of a in and out type of problem. It can linger on. A lot of it, again, goes back to the weather pattern. So I think that's probably the next thing to keep, keep in the forefront. I think, Brad, um, you're absolutely right on. And I think this relates back to what you said, John. Um, for those of you who have Tyrannus, you have a fantastic opportunity to be able to stay ahead of these. Yes. Things. Because I think Brad and I are both seasoned. I'm a little bit more seasoned than Brad. <laughs> How did we do this in the past? We yeah, walked walk out it. into the end rows and maybe 100 feet into the field, and we took our stand counts for the emergence we talked about earlier. We went and looked for insects and looked for diseases. These drones cover the whole field. Yeah, and I and think— they hit every— they, they, they pick up everything from what we well and, and luckily like our family farm we have some stuff in there so we're going to share a little bit more from our family farm since we can control that but i mean again weed outbreaks i mean we've seen it there on the app already we already know where there's issues and you know it's i again this morning i'm having a conversation with our in one of our agronomists um for an account that i deal with and it's like I, you know i'm looking at it and i'm like well wouldn't have that actually smoke some of that like why is there any weeds there you know in between the rows like i we laid it down but you know it's all about the plan now at least i can see it at least i know it's there now it's like all right well if we're gonna be spraying post in 10 days like I, this is what their pro program was like do i need to add anything what it may be and i mean that to me is just like it's so valuable it's it, not that it's not an expensive uh program by any means but um you know, I know we subsidized a little bit of the cost of it this year again to get the acres out. And, you know, for us, it, maybe that's the value too, is just having an understanding of what's going on out there. Yeah, really key because it gives you that insight to make adjustments in season. Mm -hmm. You may have had a great plan, but Mother Nature changed something yep. and you didn't get that application done. Now you're starting to see something get away from you, but you know where it's at. You know how big it is. You can make an adjustment and still have a good return on investment. Well, you know, a lot of the corn, and this is maybe going a little bit a uh, different angle, but it's still appropriate to what's 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 next. Um, a lot of the corn is probably at um, one collar V1 what? corn, and uh, by V5 um, individuals. Well, even prior to that, individuals uh, you're going to be going out there trying to take care of some of these weeds. There are also some add-ons that you can go to try to help uh, maximize every single bushel you can, and um, we have opportunities um, with growth regulators like yep. products like Radiate that Brad has uh, taken a look at or products like Takeoff. I know this is not a commercial for this podcast, but these are products that we've already looked at. We've ground treated them. That act actually uh, make a difference. And everyone that's uh, listening and watching has an opportunity to go in and to use products um, at that stage. And then even when we start getting into the VT, depending upon what we see for diseases and if with using uh the drone uh video from uh tyrannus being able to pick up those diseases early um the roi on that is going to be tremendous versus the old scout that went out and looked in the end rows and said yep you've got rust so you need to spray uh this is a whole different time with the technology that we have yeah i, I mean it just it really is it's just a different ball game so um with that you know we're kind of right at our mark you know, I appreciate everybody listening. Uh, make sure you turn in next month. Next month, we're going to be at the Farnville Research Plot um, where Brad and Dan have spent a lot of time preparing us for the year on um, what we're going to see and, and how we're going to operate uh, some of these new um, things we're bringing to market and some of our new products that we're bringing to market. Um, what we're also going to do is make sure we give everybody a little bit of a roadmap for those that are local and want to come out 
you know, on their own time and just browse around um, on where they can go find stuff and where they can go learn up there. So I mean, it's going to be a really exciting episode um, to try to learn on what we're trying to really push the envelope with from a product standpoint. Uh, I think, what is it, we got 18 or 19 acres of high-yield corn up there that yep. we're kind of throwing the kitchen sink at from a standpoint of trying to understand um, how you can stack products on top of each other for maximizing yield. Um, and then uh, I, I, we're going to bring the spray drone up for the video so everybody can see it. Um, I don't know if we'll fly it at that, at that point, but um, you know, throughout the summer, people will be able to see some of the technology that we've purchased and really are putting into action um, to back up a lot of what we're doing. So um, again, appreciate you guys being here. Uh, appreciate everybody listening and uh, look forward to the next podcast we have.